Well, what a day of chess it was. Magnus Carlsen's non-defeated streak has come to an end. It's taken 125 games and the dude abides. Duda from Poland has taken him down. It was a brilliant game. The last time Magnus lost was on July the 31st, 2018, and it took quite special play from Duda to achieve it. So let's go into the action. And Duda had the white pieces. Magnus Carlsen with black goes for the Karakhan. The thing I like about Magnus's play, even though he's got this undefeated streak, he picks a very risky line, knight to f6. And this is a very dynamic line. The last time Magnus played this was against Peter Svidler in 2018. And apparently he said after the game to David Howe that he was never going to play this move again. Here he is. Here he is with another loss. Probably won't be doing it again. And the point of this move is that after the capture on f6, black takes with the e-pawn, getting this unbalanced pawn structure. When the black king castles kingside, it's got an extra pawn defending it. The downside of this is that white has this majority of pawns over here on the queen side, which later on can be very strong, especially as white has an easy way to get a passed pawn. So structurally speaking, bad, but maybe piecewise, okay for Magnus. Now, the game continued with theoretical moves. They both developed in a standard fashion, both sides trying to get their king safe and black gets castled quickly. And now, after queen c2, the main move, check, and then h5. This is an important move in this variation. Black uses this pawn often to cause some problems if white castles this way and removes it from harm's way. White simply develops with bishop e3, and now black plays knight d7, trying to get those pieces into the game. White goes queenside. It's actually quite risky for white to castle kingside in this position because later on, black can get quite an initiative with the black knight coming around towards the king and also this queen coming on this diagonal. So queenside castling leads to this very unique and dynamic position here. Now, Magnus plays a move that's only been tried once or twice before, uh, mainly by the young Dutch talent Jordan van Forest, and that was the aggressive move b5. And this just shows that Magnus is in the mood for some action. They do say fortune favours the brave. Maybe that didn't happen here. Well, I know I've given the result away, but I think it had to be given away in this game. I know you're going to complain about that, but come on, it's big news. I've got to tell you. And this move b5 just shows that spirit of going for it it might not work in the like short term but in the long term surely fortune favors the brave and magnus has shown this throughout his last couple of years in chess the other move here would have been knight to f8 a much more solid approach but b5 it is and now to dude's credit he goes for the most ambitious move d5 this practically forces magnus to play c5 sacrificing the pawn on b5 now i would never consider capturing this pawn myself because after bishop takes b5 you open up a line towards your king but this shows the development of modern chess in modern modern era we could say people are much braver and they rely on their defensive capabilities to a much higher degree this is because most players use computers to analyze with computers show better ways to defend and modern players are learning how to grab that dangerous pawn the poison pawn and then hang tough defend you know what sarah Ann would say grab that pawn magnus now plays rook to b8 that line is now for the rook another interesting idea i was thinking about here afterwards was maybe you could force that bishop to a4 and try a move such as rook e5 the idea of this is to get the rook off that diagonal so you can try to play knight b6 next move. This could be something to investigate in the future. But rook b8 seems very natural. And now c4 might as well cement that bishop. And here Magnus plays a6, a very logical move. It's very interesting to see that ex-world champion Kramnik, a bit of a legend all round, suggested Rook takes e3 here, giving up more material. And this is a very anti-computer move. The computers hate this move. But Kramnik's idea is that after pawn takes, the black knight cements itself here. 
and white doesn't have moves like f4 to get rid of that knight. This is a very interesting way to play. The computers really don't like it, but I like what Kramnik's saying here. It's great chances to start an attack somewhere on the queen side. So a very interesting possibility. Magnus plays a6, and now the bishop retreats to a4, and he now plays rook e7. This has a similar idea to what we've seen before. The knight wants to centralize. The rook wants to come over here. White plays a good move, knight to g3, also thinking about attacking and bringing that knight to one of these attractive light squares. Black continues his plan, knight to e5, and now knight to e4, a very human move. In actual fact, a better move here would have been the preemptive bishop d2. The idea of this move is to stop the maneuver that we see in a minute, the rook coming around to b4. The bishop later on will also be quite comfortable on this diagonal. In the game, knight to e4 allowed rook to b7. Duda had a long think here, but he can't really allow rook takes b2 ideas, and he has to play b3. I think the reason he had a long think is because he was working out the complexities that were going to occur after the following exchange sack. And this is full steam ahead Magnus now. He really wanted to win this game. Just showing that risk factor was very brave. But again, Duda has to have all the credit for keeping him at arm's bay. The dude was in good form. Last time he defeated Magnus Carlsen, the Prime Minister of Poland, actually rung him up and congratulated him. So I wonder if he's going to get that phone call again tonight. I'm sure he deserves it. It's great to see these Prime Ministers and people showing so much interest in the game. Can you imagine that in America? Trump giving you a little call after you beat Magnus. Hey, Donald. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, okay. Yeah, don't breathe on me. Yep, yeah, it's okay. Okay, but anyway, on to the game. Rook to b4. And Magnus keeps throwing those pieces into the position. Rook takes a4. And again, to the human eye, this looks incredibly dangerous for white because now the rook is lined up. It's a pity this pawn on c5 is in the way because otherwise bishop to a3 would be a stunningly dangerous move. But Magnus continues developing. He can't get his queen in the attack. If that queen could get in the attack, it'd be great. But queen b6 doesn't really achieve anything here. It's not coming in. It has no entrance points in the position. And remember... What White has to do here is just survive, try to make some exchanges, and win the ending. Bishop to f5, that piece comes in. And now after rook e1, I would say the losing move. h4. This is just far too slow here. It's rare to see Magnus go wrong, but he needed to play with a little bit more urgency in the position. And the defensive play from White here is simply, simply astonishing. Knight g4 would have been a much better move, trying to create complications and entering straight into tactics. The point of this move is that after something like f3, Magnus could have captured the knight and now play a move such as bishop e5. The rook now wants to come into b2. And after, let's say, bishop to c3 here, which I think must be the normal move, the bishop moves into d4, and even this queen can now sneak into e5, and black has more inroads into white's position here. So h4 was far too slow, and now h3 stops any of these shenanigans with that knight darting into the position. The knight therefore tries to find another route in, but now another great move. The rook comes centralized, allowing the other rook to come in, and in some cases, it can make exchanges. When you're material up, you want to exchange pieces off the board. Magnus throws the knight in, and now g4, forcing the bishop back. And again, this next move, real, real class. King to d1. I mean, seriously, how many players would think of this move? Just trying to get the king away from a potentially dangerous place on the queen side. It's a weird little maneuver, and even though the king still looks like it's under a lot of threats here, there's no obvious way that black can increase the pressure. That's Magnus's problem here. He plays a very human move, f5, trying to break open the position, but now white makes some more exchanges, and he simply takes on f5. Again, both players showing no fear here. You give me a poor Magnus, um, 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 I will take it. I am the Polish Pac-Man. I'm going to munch my way through your pawns and pieces, boy. You may be world champion, but I'm going to eat them all. Magnus's idea, he gets a check, but again, Duda blocks that with f3. Black 
This queen now comes to a potentially dangerous diagonal, but it's blocked again, bishop c3. And we can see here that white's starting to get quite a harmonious position and even some counter-attacking chances with this strong piece. Black's only try is to try to get the queen into the position via the g file. But now queen e4 centralizing, queen to g2 and rook e1. Again, very nice centralization of the pieces here. Even here, as white, I'd be scared after Magnus's move. Queen takes a2. I'd be like, oh, come on, man, give us a break. He's threatening such ideas, a rook b1. But the way to get through these kind of positions, you just have to calculate and show no fear. Try to exchange, try to swap off. And there's only one move here, but it's a good one, queen c2. Offering the exchange of queens, and now the king can come to d2 because we're blocking that force field from the queen. Queen takes c4, rook to e8 check. This forces off, well, more pieces. I mean, the other options here were just as bad. Magnus's idea here is to try to complicate things by at least giving himself a check on d5. When the chips are down and you're struggling, you might as well throw everything into the pot. There's, there's no point, you know, fading away. You might as well burn in a blaze of glory. And I think that's what Magnus is aiming to do here. But White has so many pieces now, as we can see, he's material up. And as long as he holds his nerve here, which he does very well, he can get to the victory line. And there may have been easier ways for White to have won this, but it's always nice having two extra rooks. Magnus fights on. And now in this position, Duda takes quite a practical choice the best thing to do is when you're winning you know you, simplification is good but if you see an opportunity to attack you have to calculate it and in this position queen d8 would have actually been not the move that paid but a much better idea giving up your rook but forcing the black king out into the open and we can see after a series of checks that the black king is in a hopeless situation this kind of sequence will end with the black queen being lost. So Duda gives Magnus a, glimp, a glimpse of hope there with rook f8. But again, after king c1, Magnus has no checks and there's really no way in. White's pieces are stopping everything. So the game goes on, but eventually Duda manages to get some coordination, create some threats of his own. Black has to now defend and as we see, Magnus's only idea, let's go back to that point there where he gets a check in. Magnus's only idea around this moment is to try some desperation checks. The white king moves up the board and here a very practical choice. This bishop is a little bit dangerous. There are some checks here when, okay, the white king can run away. But even if you have to give a bit of material back when you're lots of material up, it's often a good way to simplify it. Get rid of any nasty tactics. And I like this move, rook takes e4. The point of this is, after rook d4, the king is very safe on a3, and all of these pieces protect, and they attack at the same time. And really now, get the hoover out. It's a mop-up job. And as we can see, Magnus throws in a couple of checks, but the rook is clearly stronger than two pawns. So that's something we should all know. The game goes on, but it ends in a great victory for Duda. And I have to say, quite a you know, quite an important moment in chess history because Magnus had this great streak, the longest ever streak of 125 wins, but the Duda stops it. What can we say about that? Well, you know, he went for it, Magnus, with the black pieces, and it was bound to end his undefeated streak. So I don't think he should be too disappointed. I mean, clearly, if he was worried about the streak, he wouldn't have played in this dangerous manner. But also, all praise to White. The Duda keeps his cool. He grabs the material. He defended perfectly. And he got a very important historical win there. I'm sure Magnus will bounce back. But we'll have to wait until tomorrow to see how he's going to cope with this loss. He's not used to losing after all. Now, do remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel. And I'm sure I'll see you all again soon.